Well, good evening for those of you who are on the East Coast. Um, this is My name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive. And as you probably all know, the, our purpose of EdChat Interactive is to talk about topics that really can transform education with the people who are actually making the transformations. And uh, there goes my phone, but uh, my wife is home, so uh, she'll hopefully get that. And um, let me just uh, let me just show an, an intro video. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen this, but I do want to show the um, the intro video. It only lasts for about a minute, just to explain a little bit about Shindig, which is the platform that we're using. Okay. Yes. Hope that was hope hope that was helpful, and enjoy the event. Let me pull up uh, my slides right here. There's a there's a few features of of Shindig that I just want to make sure that you all are aware of. Uh, one is let me uh, let me expand this a little bit and you see that there's the raise hand and ask question buttons underneath underneath your icons uh, when you raise your hand uh, I can see that and that that's a signal to me that you need to talk to me for some reason I'll mostly be in in the background so but I can uh, start an IM with you and then ask a question is a question that you ask directly of me now star won't see that question uh, but if you have uh, comments that you want Star to see, or if you have comments that you want the other participants to see, uh, when you move your cursor and, and hover over your icon, you see that there's five choices here. Uh, one of the choices is I am. And if you click on that, you'll see that there's a dialogue that comes and you can see what everybody else who's, who's, uh, who's also attending uh, is saying it's a great place to have a back channel and it's a great place for you to have um, uh, uh, an interaction with with star and then the the big reason why we're using shindig is uh, to have to allow you all to interact with each other so I'd like you to practice that now um, let me make this a little bit smaller again so that you see all the other people who are here what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to click on someone's avatar and the two of you, or three of you, get into a discussion. Uh, talk about uh, who you are and why you're here. And why, don't you, why doesn't everybody share their worst assessment story? Uh, Some place where you had to make an you assess somebody and you were uh, wrong, or you had a big negative reaction, or it had didn't affect that you wanted, or some assessment where somebody was assessing you, and and they were completely wrong. So uh, for, I'm going to give you three minutes. So click on somebody's icon and discuss with them who you are and why you're here and what's your worst assessment story. And I'm going to bring myself down. And then after that, we'll introduce Star. All right, I'm back. I hope you had a chance to talk to some other participants and uh, discuss why, uh, who you are and who they are and, and why they're here and to share some assessment stories. Uh, just one more thing, um, you know, something even more important, than, I just want to wish everybody a happy holidays. We're coming up to uh, Christmas and New Year's, and we just passed Hanukkah and Passover. So everybody, I hope you have a great holiday season and, um, and, a, and a happy and healthy New Year. Uh, this is our last EdChat Interactive of the uh, calendar year. Uh, but we're putting together our sessions for next year. We already have two scheduled for January. One is with Steve Peha, which who's who teaches writing all over the country, and he's actually going to be running a series on uh, strategies for teaching writing. That should be actually that should be really interesting. And then on January 20th is a longtime friend of mine named Sherry Crofit. She helped author a, a handbook on customized personalized learning based on the book customized personalized learning. and she's just written a course on um, how to implement customized and personalized learning in schools uh, painlessly so uh, that should also be another really interesting session and you can register <coughs> at our website uh, www.edcheck.interactive.org there's our, our commercial for our, our next two sessions and now let me introduce uh, Star Saxton. And Star, um, her new book just—I think it just was released in the in the last couple of days—called "Hacking Assessment." I'll uh, expand it for a second. 
bit better. It's available on Amazon and probably other places. You can buy it in a Kindle version um, and or a paperback version. Um, and it really has the potential of, uh, of transforming education, which is why we're having Star here with us today. Uh, Star, uh, she's a nationally board certified high school English teacher. Uh, she teaches in uh, New York in uh, Flushing, uh, which for those of you who don't know, Flushing is part of Queens, and Queens is part of New York City. And, um, and she has authored other books before, and she runs a website called starsaxstein.com. So let me, without further ado, uh, bring up Star. Well, Hi, good evening. How are you? So, well, welcome to EdChat Interactive. Hi. So, so you know, the, the question that, that I asked everybody else to, to talk about was, what was your worst assessment experience? And it just seems, um, that'd be an interesting question to ask you. What was your worst assessment experience? Um, as a student or as a teacher? Um, you know something? I'm going to leave it up to you. Uh, well, I would say that over the years, I've had quite a few doozies as far as my teaching is concerned, like ones that maybe went so badly that we I didn't even bother to count them in any capacity afterwards. Um, and, and then early in my career, I think I made a lot of missteps about um, what mattered when I was assessing students mm -hmm. and a lot of compliance-based stuff. So there was a lot of penalties points coming off when things were late or taking points off because they didn't follow directions. I was like the ultimate in like points taking off kind of person. It was, it was a really ugly situation. When I hmm. think back on it now, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a shame what I did to those early students. It's a little embarrassing. Yeah, I, you know, as you're talking, I was thinking the worst assessment experience that I've had hasn't really been with me. It was with my son, um, and he had an English teacher. And you know, there was one essay that that he wrote, and I looked it over, and his name is Herb or Herbie, and I said, you know, Herbie, this is horrible. You can do better than this. He says, I know, but I'm going to get an 86 no matter what I do. Oh no. I said, well, you no. Know, what do you mean you're going to get an 86 no matter what you do? He says, I'll tell you what. I'm going to hand this in. And you're seeing it, I'm going to get an 86. And on the next one, I'm going to do a great job. And you're going to see, I'm going to get an 86. So I said, I don't believe you, but go ahead. He hands it in. Sure enough, he gets an 86. The next one was on the, dep was on the depression. And so he finishes his report. And he gets it back. And sure enough, I mean, he, he did a great job. He gets an 86. And the margins, the teacher writes, this is the best essay you've ever written for me. She says, but I had to take off 13 points twice because in your bibliography, you listed your sources. Two of your sources said uh, the titles were 1927, and you listed them first. But nine, 19 begins with an N, so you should have listed them with the Ns, and you did it twice. So that's, thir that's uh, 12 points off for each one of those, so you get an 86. But if you hadn't done that, you would have had 100. And I just threw up my hands. I said, okay, just whatever whatever you want to do, just do. This is no sense in doing a good job. You see, it was, and I hear horrible. stuff like that, Mitch, and stuff like that absolutely drives me crazy. It's exactly why I really feel like grades really do in such a disservice. And the fact that your son was able to pick up on that is brilliant on his behalf and way to, you know, way to play it the way he did because – I don't know, like that stuff like that just makes me so angry in general. I get very angry when I hear things yep. like that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I have to say, he had a lot of great teachers. So I'm not, you know, I have no complaints about our school system. We have, you know, his whole experience was great. It was just like that one teacher um, that was, that was, it was not a fun year for him. So with that intro, maybe I should come down and I'll put your slides up. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, so you can go to the next one, Mitch. It just says, are you ready to give up grades? Keep going. 
that's me on Twitter. For those of you um, who don't follow me yet, you could follow me on, uh, at Miss Axine on Twitter. I'm pretty active. If you ever have questions for me about this or about anything else, you could certainly tag me in a tweet, and I'd be happy to get back to you as soon as possible. You can go to the next one. Okay, so kind of like what I was just starting with, um, a few years ago, it really started for me, my whole um, dissatisfaction with the grading situation started with a report card. And um, my son at the time, who was in second grade at the time, I got his report card back and it was a standards-based report card. So every single one of his standards was, break was really well broken out. And as we went through it, I had a really good idea of what he was being successful at and what he needed help on. And it felt really satisfying to be able to read teacher comments and see such a clear deletion of his mastery level in a variety of areas. And if they hadn't covered it yet, there was no score whatsoever, um, no level indicating what he knew and what he didn't know. And around the same time, I had to go and start doing report card grades for my AP class. I teach AP Lit and Comp to 12th graders. And they learn a fair bit of skills in my class, but I was only allowed to give them one grade. And I noticed as I was looking at the different profiles of each one of my students, um, any number of them could end up with a B, and their profile, their learning profile, could be wildly different. And it started to feel really bad like all of a sudden i felt like this wasn't doing what it was supposed to do if grades are supposed to communicate learning what i'm doing right now isn't really doing that so i i really started to think about how i could change what was going on in my space despite the fact that i was still functioning in a new york city school that required me to give grades and and that's how this all started that's how this crazy journey kind of got out underway. We could flip to the next one. Yeah, and, and pretty much at that point, it started to get into everything. I didn't want to put grades on the papers I was reading. I didn't want to give tests anymore. I didn't want to grade group presentations. I didn't want to put any terminal sort of, um, like I didn't want to quantify learning in any kind of way because I felt like the more I judged student work and decided what level of a grade it deserved, the less involved in the learning the students were. And I, it, it really bothered me if I spent hours reading papers, putting a whole bunch of feedback on their documents, and after I put all that work into the paper, they flipped to the back page and looked to the grade and then throw the paper in the garbage. And I spent, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour on each one of those papers. I put a fair amount of feedback on it, and it was really frustrating because, to me, the learning is actually in the feedback. It's not in the grade itself. As a matter of fact, the grade pretty much guarantees the end of learning, and and that was that was when I realized something really needed to change. You could go to the next one. Okay. So what I want you all to think about first: what do grades even mean? And why are they such a huge part of everything that we do in schools? So if you could talk to a partner in the group and start thinking about what grades mean to you, um, how you use them, why you use them, if you use them or if you don't use them, and more importantly, what do you think that they mean to your colleagues, the parents, and the students? So just take a couple minutes to talk to someone in the room to get a sense of what grades mean. So here, here's the point where we do the interactive. Uh, so please click on the icon or avatar of another participant and talk to them. Uh, you can even click on Star's icon if you wanted to talk to her. Uh, the question is, what, what do grades even mean? And why are they such a huge part of everything? So we have, uh, I have 17 after the hour now. I'm going to give you, let's give you about four more minutes to, uh, to talk to each other and I'll come down. Okay, so uh, so a few of you have been able have, have talked. 
Uh, Star, let me bring you back up right now. And now that you're back up, so I know you were you were in a conversation. Uh, what did you find out? I was. And well, I and I d interrupted it. About <laughs> you did a little bit. He was just starting to share with me about his daughter and where we are now and the kind of stuff he does. He's not in the classroom. Um, mm -hmm. I think this this whole movement, this whole idea of changing everything that we've done for such a long time around assessment takes every shareholder that will get involved. So whether you're in the classroom, whether you're a parent, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a student yourself, the, um, the necessity right now really is that we all need to work together and find some kind of consensus about um, how we could kind of move forward from here. Um, I would say that the vast majority of people that I talk to when I, even in my own school, as a matter of fact, um, they think I'm a little crazy. I'm sure you guys well, can imagine. Well, you might be. You might I, be. I might be. I, I might be. Right. A little. But, I'll I mean, just... it works. It works for me, personally. <laughs> um, I, I have been teaching high school seniors for about 14 years. That could make a person crazy. Right. Um, so, and and are lesson. there classes now where you don't grade? I don't grade in any of my classes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Even in my class, basically what ends up happening, and we'll get to this a little bit later, um, it's a conversation with kids. It's mostly standards-based. They self-assess, mm -hmm. and we talk about it. And then wow. we determine their level of mastery based on their portfolio of work. And then they tell me what they think they deserve. And I say, OK, mm -hmm. because I care that wow. little about grades that, you know, whatever yep. goes on the report card is what it is. OK. So, now, do you want do you want me to bring somebody up? Do you want me to bring Lee up? Um, we, or I mean, do you want me to continue with the slides? Why don't we go to the next slide? Because there's more. There's a bunch of stuff. Like it's already close to 7:30. I'd like to kind of get to the meat of where everything is, okay. and then okay, we could bring some more people up. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, so for me, the major part, and this is something I spend a lot of time on in the book, is that. School is about learning. It's not about winning. And I think putting grades and scores on things, and somebody put this, I think it was Laura put this in the chat, that um, kids compare their grades. It's this competitive thing. They kind of decide they are in the class based on how much better or worse they've done than other people in the class. So grades start to be this thing that starts separating kids from each other instead of focusing their energy back on what they're actually learning. You know what the most frustrating thing is as a teacher? Is when you hear a student bragging about what they got on a test. I don't know, like they got a 90 or something. And you ask them what the test was about, and they don't even know. Like they don't remember what content was on there. They don't remember the day after they take the test. But they remember the 90, which actually means nothing. The number 90 really does not mean anything. It means they did well in that second, but if they can't remember the content, then that assessment failed, as far as I'm concerned. The whole point of these assessments is to test what kids know and can do and can apply in other settings. And if we're giving them assessments where they don't even remember the content that they're learning them for, it seems pretty, it, it seems pretty silly. So the first thing we really need to do if we want to get rid of grades is start having some real conversations with kids about what learning is, what it means to them, and start shifting the mindset away from scoring high and talking about specific things that they've learned. We could switch to the next one. So, and this is really the big question. This is really the meat of what I wanted to talk about. How, how do we do this, right? So. Learning in general, we all know, depending on our content areas, when we're kind of bringing information in and out of situations, we want kids to be able to then take whatever skill or content that we have and be able to apply it to different areas of their lives, not just our classes. I mean, the best scenario is somebody learns something in my English class, they're able to apply it in social studies. And if they're really, really thinking about reflection, also apply that in math or 
the scientific process depending on where they are and if we start teaching kids about skills and we give them the language of their learning the likelihood of them being able to connect things later is is much higher Can we go to the next slide okay so hacking assessment is basically a book that talks about how you could change the way kids think about learning in classes. Basically what it does is there are 10 hacks starting from the very beginning and starting from your general area of comfort with what you could go all the way like I have and give up grades completely, or you can take small pieces of the strategies that are there and apply them to what works for your school and your setting. So there are varying levels of readiness, and I accept that. And hacking assessment kind of walks you through very specific steps, very practical steps of moving to the next level. Let's go to the next one. OK, so these are basically the, the specifics of what you would learn to do if you read hacking assessment. It's going to teach you how to get stakeholders to buy in. That's your administrators, that's your colleagues, that's the parents, that's the kids, anyone in your school community who may be a naysayer. And each one of the chapters actually addresses the major pushback that you'll likely get, major pushback that I know that I've received and a lot of the people that I've spoken with while I was writing the book, um, what, what their major question were, questions were. Um, the idea of rebranding assignments, no longer worksheets or anything like that, but really robust projects that give kids an opportunity to be innovative and creative and lets them approach it from an angle that works for them. It's going to facilitate student partnerships in the way we assess them and the way they assess themselves and then being able to have a dialogue with them rather than a one-sided, like, I say you deserve this and so it is. Um, it teaches you how to maximize time. Um, I confer with every single student, both in and out of class. Uh, I spend a lot of time giving them feedback, and there are specific processes that you can use to do that better in your class. Um, data is all the buzz these days, and there are some definite tips on how you could maintain the data using Google Forms and other kinds of um, other kinds of technology to really make the data collectible and easy to access and track. You're going to teach kids how to track their own progress. There's a whole section on reflection and self-grading, and then ultimately moving them to portfolio assessment, which is the end goal, having them select their, their best examples of learning and having them be able to discuss it in some kind of presentation form. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so the first part is promoting buy-in. So how many of you right now, if you said to someone at your school, I think we should give up, I should, I think we should give up grades, move to standards-based assessments, what do you think people would say to you? How would they respond? Um, think of the most traditional person at your school and what's the response you'd likely get in if you had this conversation. So why don't why don't we talk for a second about different ways we might be able to get people on board with the idea of changing their practice because it's not just trying to get them to do something, it's trying to get them to acknowledge the fact that what they're doing isn't working as well as it can be. And I'll say, you know, rather than stop the presentation, although we could do that, another way of, of doing this is people could just put in their comments in the IM window. Yeah, so again, if you haven't done that, if you move your cursor and hover over your screen, you see that there's an option for IM. It brings up a window, and you can put your comments in right there. And then, Star, you can address them. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't see them as the administrator, but uh, you're the person who really is, is running the, the show. So uh, let me bring your slides back up, but I just wanted to make that suggestion in case you wanted to do it. No, I, that's actually perfect. And Lee put in there, you know, without grades, students won't try. Man, do I hear that all the time. You might be surprised to hear that my students try harder, I think, now without the grades than they ever did before because it's not competitive. Each one of them is trying to achieve mastery at this point, and I think when they see how much feedback they're getting, which is a lot more than what the grades ever offered, 
they are genuinely invested in being better students. It takes a little bit of time, but it definitely, yeah, parents, Parents won't think they're doing anything until they see these crazy portfolios that these kids have. And I can tell you right now in my class, my AP students are making satire movies. We're going to start screening them tomorrow. Um, after having written their own modest proposals, they are now applying their knowledge in a synthesis assignment. And in a small group, they wrote scripts. They're using some elements of A Christmas Carol and they have made a satire movie out of it. And basically students, students are seeing that assessments can happen and they don't all have to be on paper. And whether it's, you know, creating a Prezi and giving a presentation or a screencast to do a tutorial or a skit in class or a Tableau installation or a satire movie or writing a paper, all of those I think are much better means because while they're doing the work in class, I have a better opportunity to actually be a part of the process with them. It's not like a, they have 40 minutes to sit down and show me what they know that they've memorized. Um, it's much more of a process-based learning that allows them to learn over time and apply the feedback that they're getting and really internalize it and then use it moving forward. And, and that's how we use reflections as well. So the buy-in I feel comes when students see how much they're growing and, and it happens relatively quickly. Um, in the beginning, you have a lot of conversations about what learning is and you have them talk about the things that matter to them and then you challenge it. If a student told me that you know it was important to them to get good grades, I would ask, well, what do good grades represent to you? And, you know, that means I'm doing well. And then I'll say to them, well, does it mean you're doing well? Because it could mean you've done all your homework, whether or not you did it well, did it matter? It could mean that you did extra credit. It could mean that the teacher likes you maybe. Or if you didn't do well, maybe you are very following the rules and people just like taking points off like I used to do. Um, so the, the kids have to, I, I am, a little bit on an island in my school, but the kids rave about my space. And I think that more folks are sort of catching on to what I do. And I, I think the, the work that my students are doing, you can't refute the fact that they're learning amazing things because they just, they do amazing work. Um, and that has little to do with me, I think. I think it has a lot to do with how I support them in their creative ventures. and used to be very much a no person. Things had to be the way I wanted them to be. And now I'm a yes person. If a kid has an idea that I hadn't thought of, rather than say, no, you can't do that, I allow them to humor that whim and follow it. And if it doesn't work out, it's a learning experience for both of us. And if it does, it's usually far better than anything I could have planned. So I, I think the work really does speak for itself. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, and we just talked about that, so we could kind of move to the next one. This is our rebranding assignments idea. Um, so many folks just sit and have kids either go to the textbook and answer questions, but what we really need to be doing now in school is putting the questioning power into the students' hands, allowing their interest and inquiry to really um, drive the, the direction class goes in. And if we can really provide students with meaningful synthesis projects, ones they can't plagiarize, ones they can't go onto Google and find the answers to, then we know the stuff they're producing actually takes a fair amount of innovative thinking. Um, what I love is when a student goes into a project and they choose the creative one, if that's what they're gonna do, they're like, Miss Saxton, this is gonna be so easy. And then midway through, they're like, Miss Saxton, this was so much harder than I expected. Um, and I kind of laugh because I know it's harder than they expected before they even tried because I don't really think most students are used to being put in a scenario where they have to create something from scratch that, dem that demonstrates their understanding. They're used to teachers giving them prompts and having to answer questions that they could Google. And as teachers nowadays, as the skills sort of change, we have to make our projects, and this is a word that I have made up, ungoogleable. Um, 
if if kids could find answers from Google like that, then our work isn't rigorous enough. That's and that's what we want to get away from. We want to really like Bloom's highest order stuff is creation and synthesis and we want kids to be in positions where they have the opportunities to attack problems from different angles and really present what they know about a subject in a way that is meaningful to them instead of what is meaningful and easy to us. Um, and I think that that's one of the major things. I think school right now is really rigged for teachers. Essentially, is something that is much easier for a teacher than giving feedback to 34 students in a class. That requires a lot of effort. That requires a lot of time. And when I could just look at a test or a paper and decide it's a grade and then give them that grade and that grade means so very little, I think we need to stop doing what's best for us and consider who the learning is really for. We go to the next one. So facilitating student partnerships. What I mean by this is that students need to be involved in every aspect of their learning. So they even should be like involved in, involved in some way in the content development. Um, when we're thinking about our curriculum and what has to get covered, um, we know the content that we need to get through, but the way in which we get through it and the order in which we get through it should be fluid. Um, we should be able to find ways to get students to access the information in a way that's meaningful to them and also advantageous to their learning. Um, so something we really need to consider is what they have to say to us, give them lots and lots of opportunities for them to share our ideas. And a real novel thing to do after that is to truly listen to what they're saying to us and take the opportunity to take the feedback they've provided and then change it in our lessons. I could tell you right now, this year I switched two books out of my AP curriculum because my students weren't responding to it the way that I thought they would. And I chose two things that were wildly different this year and they definitely changed the dynamic. Um, I got rid of Gulliver's Travels, which I happen to have loved. Um, I think Swift is a humorous genius and unfortunately I was laughing alone. So instead of continuing to use Swift, I brought in Lysistrata, which was both racy and enjoyable. And we switched out Great Expectations, which was also never really a winner with the kids. And we um, put in A Christmas Carol instead. And I was able to achieve what needed to be achieved without going the route that I thought I was going to. And the kids also have a ton of choice in um, which books they're reading on the sides. Let's go to the next one. OK, so maximizing time. I mean, how many of you listening right now really feel like you never have enough time to accomplish what you need to accomplish in class? And when I said I confer with 34 students and I make sure to back to everyone, I'm sure some of us are thinking there's no way to do that in, in a meaningful way without your entire life. Um, admittedly, as an English teacher, time is definitely at a premium. So if we have good project-based classrooms where students are actively engaged in what's going on in their own learning, during that project time, if they are engaged, a teacher doesn't necessarily need to be at the front of the room. I could pull kids aside either in small groups while they're working on their projects, or I can also talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Now, one way that I talk about in the book that is really, really awesome is providing students with these Google Forms where they give me feedback before we meet. So we don't really waste time having them go through their stuff to tell me what they need because they've already prepared for the conference that we have together by thinking, um, revisiting their work and really thinking about what they're doing and then really trying to articulate what it is their goals are and how they'd like me to help them with them. I read their, you know, I read their feedback and then we sit down and we have a conversation and for five minutes in class, we sit, we talk, and we spend that time really thinking about how to improve where they are. This is also an excellent way to really truly differentiate class because every kid is getting specifically what they need instead of a one size fits all. Let me go to the next slide, please. Yes. Um, digitizing data and tracking student progress with tech. 
So again, going back to Google, which is like the awesome, the Google educational suites, like the best thing since sliced bread in education as far as technology is concerned, because it really does allow for a very collaborative um, environment. And what we can do is we can start gathering this data like I was talking about before and teaching students to then take the feedback we provide to them and tracking them in some kind of document. So if I tell a student, hey, you know, you really need to work on cohesion in your essays, these ideas aren't really smoothly working together. These are a few strategies you can use to work on cohesion. They could then gather that information from the Google Doc that they were working on, put it in a separate one with the assignment that they got that on, reflect about it at the end of the project, and then when they start the next project, that's where the goals are coming from. They're actually coming from the feedback they got before. And then when they work on the next project and they put the strategies that we talk about in play, we have the opportunity then to sort of allow them to really try out what works and doesn't work. And then when they reflect on it again, what they do for me, which is awesome, is tell me how well it worked, point to where it is in their essays that I need to look. And then the feedback that they get is very, very, very specific to what they were working on. And it gives us an opportunity to exchange. So if I read the reflection before I read the project, I know exactly what I'm looking for. And I can really, really, really focus on what kids need. And the kids themselves become tremendous self-advocates and are able to really articulate the things that they need in their learning. And they start to ask better questions. And they also start to get a much better sense of who they are as learners. Go to the next slide, please. OK. So I, I can't even read my own slide because we're too big here. Um, OK, so what kind of things are you doing already to help ease the time management challenge of tracking progress in your class? So are you, are you guys already doing this? I'd love for you to talk to a partner for a second. I'm just going to run for a second to get the plug to my computer because it's going to die. So hold on a sec. So again, this is a, another chance, if you can, to uh, click on the avatar of another participant in the room. Uh, Star will be back in a second. Or, uh, or if, if you don't have audio and video, maybe you can ask, answer the question by entering something into the IM. Uh, what kind of things are you doing already to help ease the time management challenge of tracking progress? Uh, you know, because I, you know, Star was talking about the fact that it's hard to give. It's a lot harder to give feedback to 34 students than it is to give them a grade. Uh, multiply that by four classes or five classes, and you're giving feedback to 150 students. So are there things that any of you are doing that, uh, that help you maximize your time or leverage your time so the students are getting feedback um, that's meaningful, but you're not working 100 hours a week? I'm going to stop my broadcast and I'll bring uh, Star back up. Getting stuff about trying to give voice recorded comments. And oh my God, yes. Can I just tell you that Voxer has been a lifesaver for me? That and Google Hangouts, which I do use with my students, um, it's a great way to communicate with people when we're not in the same space. So. Voxer is really great because if I'm reading a student's paper and I want to give them feedback and sometimes I feel the feedback might be mistaken if they read it, it's always better for them to hear my voice because I don't know, I think I could sound a little more sympathetic than perhaps my words sound on the page. And if a kid's already feeling defensive when they're getting feedback, chances are they're going to hear the worst version of what it could sound like instead of the best. So Voxer is really a great way for me to communicate with my kids about um, about their learning. And they could, it becomes, again, more of a dialogue than just me telling them what they do well and what they need work on. And more of me saying, you know, do you see this spot that I'm talking about right here? Can you tell me a little more about what you meant? I'm a little confused. And then we could kind of have a conversation back and forth. So stuff like that, and, and it maximizes driving time during my commute because I could do Voxer while I'm driving in the car um, since it's like a walkie-talkie if you guys don't know where that is. Um, 
I like Jing also for screencasts. I've been using Screencast-O-Matic, and I've taught the kids to use that as well. Um, but there's lots of different things you can use in um, to, to give feedback in that way. Can we go on to the next one? So another thing that's really, really big for me these days is teaching reflection and self-grading. And I, I teach them as two separate things. I, I also have a book out right now with ASCD called Teaching Students to Self-Assess. And it's also a very, it's one of their arias. And it's a really short book that talks about very specific ways to teach kids to reflect. This one does that as well in a much more shortened form. The reflections that my students write are they, they first they break down what it is they were asked to do. It tells me their process. It gives them a chance to really talk about how they're addressing standards. You could scaffold that process by giving them the standards that you're specifically assessing them on, or you can offer them an opportunity to determine which standards work best for the project themselves. Um, and, and that's another way to really, really get them thinking about their learning. And honestly, the Reflection and the conversation and the feedback of what make the no grade classroom possible. Um, we need to get kids to be able to really understand their learning and how to be precise with what they're asking for and what they need and really, really precise so that they know how to grow moving forward. And reflection is a great way to do that. And if we build reflection into the learning process in class, whether we give time to them, you know, for them to think during um, a unit, before a unit, after a unit, after a project, whenever you want to do it, um, I think it's a really valuable way to let them consider where they are. And especially after every major assignment my students do, they're required to write a one to two page um, typed single space reflection that really addresses what they felt they took away from the assignment. And I really couldn't be more pleased with the kind of stuff they're giving me. Can we move to the next one? OK, so portfolios for assessment instead of tests. I really hate tests. Um, I teach an AP class, but I do not teach to the test. I refuse to do it. Um, I won't spend one time, you know, until the very last week before the actual exam, I drill kids on multiple choice questions. I've been talking to the college board for a little while now too about maybe allowing my students to submit their final, um, their final research paper, which is a 15 page um, researched paper through a specific critical lens of their choosing. We go to the college library, they do research at the university and they, they learn a whole bunch of really important college skills and I'm telling you, these kids produce work that, you, that they probably won't have to produce in college until their junior years. And I, I think that that says a lot about the expectation in the class. That when we start out, most kids don't think that they'll be capable of it, but the class is scaffolded in such a way that they're developing stamina for writing all year long. And portfolios are a really awesome way for students to actually identify their own growth because if they're collecting their work all along the way, they could always look back to that work and compare it to new work. And I think that that's when they really start to see the difference and also be, you know, later in the year, they're able to articulate those moments of growth in ways that they couldn't articulate before. And, and I think that it's very possible. Many universities are moving away from the traditional grading as well. I'm working on a survey right now to try to get a sense of which institutions in specific are, are changing their practices. I did do an interview with a woman who's um, an admissions officer at Bard not too long ago, and they specifically told me about their alternative practices of accepting students now. And I hear stuff like that and it warms my heart. Plus there's a growing number of homeschooled students that don't have transcripts the same way that high school students do um, in regular traditional schools. So people are getting accepted on portfolios and maybe SATs as well, but schools are getting rid of SATs also. Can we move to the next one? So is there anything I haven't covered yet that you really want answered? Um, we're kind of running out of time. There's about nine minutes left, and I certainly want to make sure you guys get what you need. 
what you came here for. So if you have questions you'd like to ask, I would love to answer them. Or if you'd like to come on stage and ask it in front of everybody, uh, click on the raise hand button and I'll bring you on stage. Uh, so, so, you know, one question that, that, that I'm asking is that as you were talking, I was, I, I was thinking a lot of what you're doing is you're giving the students voice. Yes. Um, have you looked at the student voice movement or, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Um, well, voice is an essential part to everything that I do. And I think when we put the control into the students' hands instead of our hands, and we really have a truly student-centered space where their voices are valued and um, really taken into consideration, the learning environment becomes a lot richer because they really do have amazing things to say. And I think they often are silenced by our expectation and you know how we have to get through material. So as soon as we kind of change the way we see the learning, where the depth of learning happens when we allow them to explore topics more readily instead of just kind of industrial revolutionize, you know, doing the whole industrial model of getting them through the day, one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, it's not a very, it's not an effective way of learning anymore. I'm not really sure it was ever terribly effective, unfortunately. Probably not. And and then it's. It, one of the things that, that also struck me is you you were, you talked a lot about your AP course and uh, it be I, I'm just hearing in the back of my head somebody saying yeah of course it works for AP students but I'm teaching seventh graders or somebody else saying well I'm teaching kids who are in se in uh, eighth grade but they're reading at a third grade level how can I you know how can I do that don't I just have to drill them more and just give them grades how would you respond? Um, I've actually, last year I taught a ninth grade ICT class, which is essentially um, a special ed collaborative. And mm -hmm. my class was 65% special ed, 35% gen ed. And I did not grade them. It was a journalism class, so it was a writing class. And mm -hmm. it worked as effectively in that space, if not more, because special needs students in particular already feel like failures a lot of times because the traditional system fails them so badly. And I feel like as soon as we start really listening to them and giving them multiple opportunities to show what they know, they know a lot more than a lot of the traditional methods really let on. So mm -hmm. if I have a room full of special needs kids and I know they're much better at maybe, let's say, creating something with their hands, something three-dimensional, as opposed to writing, or they like to talk more than they like to write, as a journalism teacher, I'm able to let them do a podcast or a PSA, or if they don't want to be on film, they could use something with a storyboard and do a, a voiceover and do some other, you know, the technology is a great help in this regard. So mm -hmm. it's not just in my AP class, it's also in my newspaper class, and it's also in, you know, other journalism classes that I taught and other electives and also other regular English classes that I've taught. Mm -hmm. um, and I also help, you know, my math colleagues do stuff like this in their class as well. And they do some kind of hybrid where um, they do data analysis of the kinds of skills that are being addressed. And when they give students full scores, they get a breakdown of levels of proficiency based on the specific content mm -hmm. and skill set that they have for that. So it is mm -hmm. possible. It's just about being creative. No, it seems to me if you take a lot of kids and let's say they're, they're not doing so well in school. They're in eighth grade and they're reading at a fifth grade level. And if somebody were to say, yeah, but for these kids, I just have to keep on drilling them and I have to keep on giving them, them grades. But that's not working for them now. No. So it seems to me that's almost the definition of insanity. It's, you know, you're doing, you're doing something and it's not working, so you're going to do more of it. Uh, let's try maybe something else let's, and, and see if we can be amazed by giving them a voice, uh, letting them reflect and grade themselves and, and not relying so much on grades. I, I think that every child feels more successful when they've had an opportunity to show what they know in a way that's meaningful to them. And so much mm -hmm. of school right now is not meaningful to kids anymore. They don't even understand why they're there half the time. And because of that, a lot of them don't show up. 
So it's mm -hmm. our job to help them understand very, very, very transparently how this relates to their life now. How it's going to relate 10 years from now when they're in college or after college or any of that. We need to stay very firmly planted in where we are right now and get these kids engaged in a way that makes them excited about right now. Because a mm -hmm. lot of them are, you know, they don't, a lot of adolescents don't have the capacity to see to the future. They're very present oriented. And we need mm -hmm. to know the psychological development of the kids that we work with. So are there questions that are appearing in the IM? Because I don't see the IM, but. Um, um, it says high school is about doing school and getting grades while college is maybe about learning. Um, I to know. I think high school doesn't have to be about doing school. I think that's the way we've set it up, but who's to say we can't change that? High school should be about learning too. Maybe it's time that we start changing the structure of what high school looks like so that it's not, you know, these are the requirements for graduation. Maybe it's time for us to say, kids have interests in these areas and we can access different content through these specific areas, whether it's using the maker movement or getting them involved in different ways like coding or anything that really has su substantial um, product-based pro skills that really force them to think critically. So it looks like uh, Lee would like to come up. So I'm going to stop my broadcast and let him come up because he probably has a question. So I'm going to have to uh, log off in a moment, but I really wanted to thank you. And um, it's just, I think it's an incredible movement that is just so overdue. And um, just wanted to thank you for, for your continued support. And we'll look, you know, we'll look to collaborate as we do work with, um, with colleges as well as, as high schools. And it's just some of the feedback that we get that kids are in high school and while I agree it should be about today and the present, so many of them are just doing it as, you know, what do I got to do to survive? And, you know, if college is in my future, what do I have to do to get into college? And it's not until they're out of high school where they begin to have the time and space to reflect and actually be engaged with learning. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's precious what uh, what you know what we're what we're seeking to do i totally agree with you lee um honestly like i i think we need to start valuing the time that we spend in class a little bit more than we do and we have to really reconsider what the school day looks like because 45 minutes just isn't enough time to get deeply into anything and if we want kids to be reflective we need to build it into the day they need to be going to less classes in a day and spending more time, maybe fewer times a week in different settings where they really do have an opportunity to explore their own stream of inquiry around the contents that we teach. And I think it's very possible. We just we need to keep ourselves open to, to these changes and not really tie ourselves into what school was.